You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. If you've ever heard a blooper reel from this show, or if you've ever paid really close attention to the background noises during interviews, then you have met my cat, Pav. She will turn three this year. We got her as a kitten, yes, during the pandemic, like so many of you. And she likes to be involved in whatever's going on. How did she get back? The cat got all the way back to jump down again, but she didn't go. Anyway, there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's always something. Um, I mean, hold on a second. I'm going to get this toy away from my cat, who's going to ruin our recording here. One second. <laughs> It would not be a big story episode without an appearance by the cat. I'm loving her appearances. I think those clips are objectively cute. They're adorable, even. But now I am a little worried that they are a sign of something darker. You see, Pav is an indoor cat. We live in a busy neighborhood in Toronto. There are coyotes in the park nearby. And I don't want her to kill all the birds that she likes to mutter at through the window screen. And I thought I'd made my peace with that. And she had too. Until I learned about ethical pet ownership. And more importantly, until I learned that the kind of behavior you heard in those clips can indicate severe boredom. And I learned how cruel pet ownership can be even casually without the owners realizing it. Now, before you flood our inbox and our voicemail with calls for my head, please understand, I have owned pets my entire life. I care for them and love them and spoil them and would do anything for them. So that's why I had to think so hard about this and why I wanted you to hear about it. So, should I really have a pet? Should you? Should anyone? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Get out of here, cat. Kenny Torella is a staff writer for Vox with a focus on animal welfare. Hello, Kenny. Thanks so much for having me, Jordan. You're very welcome. I'm going to start off with a very simple question. You focus on animal welfare, and yet, by reading your piece, you seem to hate kitties and puppies. You monster. Why? <laughs> you know, I got a few responses uh, on that same tone uh, when I published my article, The Case Against Pet Ownership. And um, actually, I am a lifelong animal lover. I grew up with uh, a cat and fish and hamsters, and I've lived with dogs for uh, over the last 10 years. Um, and it's actually my love for animals that really made me start to question the whole endeavor of keeping pets. Um, you know, I adopted uh, my dog, Evie, six months into the pandemic, like so many other people. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, you know, I just had this question gnawing at me, is Evie just bored and frustrated for so many hours of the day while I'm, you know, typing away at my computer, ignoring her, her begging for attention. And so that sent me down this rabbit hole of uh, this huge body of literature that also just questions this norm we have around pet keeping in the U.S. and globally. I'm very glad to hear that you're a pet owner. Um, I'm a lifelong pet owner as well. Um, interestingly enough, we grew up with cats, but they were outdoor cats. Now that uh, I have a family of my own, we have a cat, but she is an indoor cat because I've learned about all the things she will kill and destroy if I let her outside. And we can talk about that a little later. But maybe first, as we just sort of set the stage here, tell me about uh, an author named Jessica Pierce and the case for ethical pet ownership. And maybe begin with, you know, some of the most blatant examples of what we would consider when we think of that. Yeah, so when I went down this rabbit hole of worrying that my dog Evie was just so bored all day, it led me to this bioethicist and author named Jessica Pierce, uh, who has written about dogs and cats and, and pets for, for years. And her book, Run, Spot, Run, The Ethics of Pet Keeping, really opened my mind uh, on this issue. And, you know, she kind of starts off with 
some of the most blatant forms of animal abuse that I think, you know, any any decent listener would condemn. You know, issues like animal hoarding, puppy mills, dog fighting, physical abuse, even bestiality. And you know, some of these uh, problems are more common than you'd think. I mean, hmm. just as an example, there was a message board uh, for people who uh, were into bestiality and they had over a million members before they were shut down. Wow. And there have also been surveys of college students asking them, have you ever abused an animal or have you witnessed animal cruelty? And a pretty surprising number of them have said yes. Now, you know, there's not good data, mm -hmm. but I think just off the bat, there are some really serious and grave human abuses done to our cats and dogs that I think any you know pet owner would agree are wrong that are more common than we might think. Yeah, and that's how most people would understand bad pet owners or people who should never have pets, right? Um, abuse, dog fighting, all that kind of stuff. And, and that's really understandable. But since we're talking probably to pet owners here uh, who deeply love their pets, Tell me about the edge cases. Like uh, I mentioned, my cat is now an indoor cat. She is indoors all day. Am I a bad pet owner because she's stuck indoors? Well, I don't think you're a bad pet owner because she's stuck indoors. I think that just the constraints of modern life make it really hard to give a cat or a dog a good life. And I think in the case of your cat, you know, I, I would assume that your cat, I mean, I, I, I may not be right. Every cat is different. But cats and dogs and, and all animals, including humans, really like to be outdoors, to be able to use their senses. And cats really like to hunt and smell. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, your cat is indoors all day, they can't do that. But if you let your cat outdoors, well, they could easily get run over. They could spread or catch a disease. They could kill birds and other wildlife. And so this is just, you know, one of many examples where, you know, we may be inflicting suffering on our animals by keeping them indoors all day, but letting them outdoors all day isn't a great solution either. What are some of the other kinds of things that we might not notice or even be aware of, or maybe even think we're doing a great job for these animals, but if you look at how it impacts them, might be considered neglect or even cruelty? Right. So Jessica Pierce, you know, in her book, Run, Spot, Run, she highlights those more blatant forms of abuse, but then also says, hey, if, if we actually look under the hood of this very sunny, wholesome narrative we have around pet keeping, we might find some ugly stuff, maybe even some things we could be guilty of. And, you know, that goes across the board, everything from verbal abuse to, you know, prolonged captivity of cats or dogs. Um, like you mentioned, you know, the extreme confinement of small animals like fish or mice or reptiles. Mm -hmm. Abusive training or aversive training is very prevalent among dog owners. A lot of people might keep their animals outdoors in extreme temperatures. There's also the issues of lack of exercise and socialization, lack of veterinary care and grooming, boredom, um, abandonment. You know, one study found that in the U.S., up to 20% of cats and dogs adopted from shelters could be returned. Wow. Um, the list goes on and on and on of all of these issues that, you know, aren't as blatant as some of the things we've talked about. But when you add them all up and you consider that there are, in the U.S., 250 million animals kept as pets, around 28 million in Canada, it could be, you know, a lot of, of what I call lower grade cruelty and neglect that could be inflicting a lot of suffering on animals. Let's talk about how we uh, tend to view that. And I mean, we can talk about cats in particular, but I think this applies to other pets as well, which is we tend to assume that they have an ideal life, right? You know, we joke like get to sleep as long as you want, you can sleep 15 hours a day, then you wake up and you get fed as much as you want and you just get to do no work and hang out and it's a lovely life, you're well cared for. Do these animals see it that way? What do we know? Yeah, so it, it's complicated because, you know, one thing that an ethologist named Mark Beckoff told me is that, you know, while dogs, they tend to have a lot of energy, they also really like to sleep. They like to be well rested so that they can be on guard and be alert. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like you mentioned, uh, you know, we have this, you know, running joke that pets are really pampered. They get to lay around 
and be fed treats and maybe play occasionally. But Jessica Pierce said, you know, for a lot of cats and dogs, just laying around all day being fed treats is probably a profoundly boring and frustrating life for an animal. Right. And hearing that really made me wonder like, wow, you know, am I boring my dog all day by not being able to give her attention, not being able to play with her or take her on walks or have her play with other dogs. And so I do think that there very well could be, you know, (laughs) an epidemic of pet boredom. Mm -hmm. Um, It might seem a little silly on the surface, but boredom is a really, really frustrating emotion. And I think for humans, we're lucky enough that we don't really have to experience it much. You know, we can pick up our phone or get on our laptop or turn on the TV and have, you know, literally an endless stream of entertainment. Right. But for cats and dogs and other animals, they are completely dependent on us for their basic needs, which I would consider, you know, exercise and socialization and play certainly basic needs. And you mentioned you adopted your dog in the pandemic. Um, I know a lot of people who have done this. Obviously, the numbers show a ton of people did this. Um, How does that exacerbate the problem you just described? Yeah, so, uh, you know, speaking for the United States here, uh, in the pandemic, you know, one in five households adopted a new pet. And there's a really great aspect to this. You know, a lot of animal shelters were reporting that they were adopting animals out in record numbers. And that's great news. Right. But, you know, the lockdown nature of the pandemic only lasted so long. And so once people started getting vaccines, they started going back to work, having more social time. And our pets had a hard time adjusting. You know, there is one Forbes study that found really high rates of chewing and and digging and destruction and barking and howling and, you know, attempts at escaping and urinating and defecating indoors in early 2022, which was this time when society had really adjusted to having been vaccinated and life returning to somewhat normal. Mm -hmm. And so that's just like one striking example of a kind of real world test as to how cats and dogs other and other animals deal with captivity and isolation and boredom as they were adjusting to their owners changing schedules. Why does it feel kind of taboo to talk about this as loving pet owners, ostensibly anyway? I mean, there's a reason that I joked off the top, like, why do you hate puppies, you know? So yeah, it does feel very taboo. You know, when I went to publish this article, I was afraid that I would be ripped apart by the internet. <laughs> um, But to my surprise, the general response kind of fell into two categories. And one was, hey, I'm I'm glad you wrote this because I had been having some discomfort with keeping pets for years and I couldn't quite articulate it. When I brought it up, people thought I was crazy. Hmm. But this kind of makes some intuitive sense. Then there was this other reaction that was, hey, I was totally ready to hate this and hate you. But I actually kind of agree with a lot of what you're saying here. Yeah. And so I think this is one of those issues that is kind of hidden in plain sight that a lot of people have some level of discomfort with leaving their cat or dog or other animal alone all day. They worry they might be bored. They might be frustrated that their cat or dog are, you know, in in their eyes, quote unquote, misbehaving. Um, And that can be frustrating. So I think because there are 28 million pets in Canada, 250 million pets in the US, this is a really intimate issue that most people have experiences with and thus they might have some complicated experiences with. And it feels taboo to talk about because like I mentioned earlier, we you know we have this really sunny, wholesome narrative around pet keeping. But when you actually dig under the surface, there's a lot of conflict. There are a lot of ethical issues that... I should be clear, I'm not above. You know, I kind of wrote this article to force myself Mm -hmm. to really dive deeper into pet keeping to give my dog a better life and to try to hold myself accountable. Tell me about the money behind it. You mentioned 28 million pets in Canada. Um, That's almost one for every person in the country. Same in the United States. Um, How big is this business and how much is invested in making sure we keep acquiring pets and Keep buying them stuff. Yeah, it's it's enormous. In the U.S., it's about a $130 billion industry. In Canada, it's almost a billion. 
And so a lot is riding on keeping this wholesome narrative going to not only keep breeding dogs and cats in the puppy mills that I talked about, but also, you know, selling dog and cat toys and food and supplies and veterinary care and grooming and uh, and boarding. And so there's a lot riding on keeping this narrative going, but I think it's important, you know, that we question it and really, you know, second guess and think twice about the whole endeavor of pet keeping. What should we watch for if we've already got a pet and, you know, someone's listening to this episode and thinking, oh boy, um, what are the signs of boredom or, you know, depression, I guess, uh, in pets that we can actually see and kind of identify and maybe change? Yeah, so I spoke with a biologist named Charlotte Byrne in the United Kingdom, and she's at she's at a veterinary college. And she said there are two main animal responses to boredom. And the first is drowsiness, which we can see in animals as, you know, yawning, staring off into space, sighing, even if they're not tired. The second is restlessness. So that can look like engaging in behaviors to try to stay awake. They might try to escape. They could take risks. They could explore things, even if they're not interested. And so I think throughout the day, we should be keeping an eye on our pets and looking for these signs and doing as much as as we can within reason to try to give them a more enriching and stimulating life. That's really good advice. Um, And so far, we've kind of talked about yeah, practical stuff uh, that we can watch for and that we can do and maybe we should think about um, as pet owners. But there are some more extreme opinions out there. Tell me about pet abolitionists. Right. So there there are some parts of the you know animal rights movement that say we shouldn't be keeping pets at all. And, you know, one of the loudest voices on this issue is uh, a Rutgers philosophy and law professor named Gary Francione. And he says, look, We have this legal system in the United States, and I presume it's not too different in Canada, where cats and dogs and other animals have little to no legal protections. Mm -hmm. You know, their their legal protections are kind of more like objects than humans. And so as a result, the welfare standards are always going to be incredibly low, and the accountability for abusing an animal is already is always going to be very low as well. And it's also really hard to keep anyone accountable for how they treat their pets because pet abuse happens in the privacy of the home. If you take all of these animal cruelty problems together and we ask, okay, is all of the suffering and cruelty and neglect worth the joy and happiness that pets bring us, I don't think the answer is so clear cut. And so I don't know if we should abolish pet keeping altogether. I think it's obviously a political and cultural non-starter to suggest as such. But I do think we should radically rethink the role of pets in modern life. I think the idea of abolishing pets is is really interesting. Uh, It gives us a lot to chew on. It's certainly not going to happen anytime soon. Let me ask you about the flip side of that. You know, you mentioned for the joy and comfort that it brings us, and we've talked a lot about how um, pets can be bored and and maybe neglected, but pets also love us. Like, I don't think there's any any doubt that, you know, when you come home, your dog is happy to see you and my cat likes to be petted and all that kind of stuff. Like, the animals are not, as much as they may be bored or neglected uh, at times, they also, you know, clearly get some positive emotions out of their humans. That's right. Clearly cats and dogs and other animals can have really enriching lives and have amazing relationships with their human counterparts. I certainly feel that way about my dog, Evie. And one thing I should say is that at the end of the day, you know, there's always a lot of mystery here. As much as we can try to observe cats and dogs and infer how bored or not bored they are, um, we're never going to completely know. Mm -hmm. But I think I always come back to this question of, are we keeping pets more for us? Whether we want to keep them as a companion or as like a casual hobby or kind of have them as an accessory? Or are we doing it out of altruism because we saw a cat or a dog in a shelter who is going to otherwise be euthanized and we wanted to save their life? One thing I kept hearing in my interviews with animal experts is, yeah, we should really think more about the give and take relationship between humans and animals. And often 
we're doing a lot more taking than giving, and maybe we need to rebalance a bit here. Last question. I know we're not going to see uh, pet abolition anytime soon, or should I say pet emancipation? I don't know <laughs> what the proper term for it is, but we're not going to give up pets. Nobody's going to do that. But can you actually see humans taking steps to own pets differently or having fewer pets or, you know, giving the ones they have now better lives. Just given the size of the industry that we discussed here, there's a ton invested in in making sure that, uh, to your point, we see that cute kitten in a shelter and we feel like we're doing something amazing by taking them home. Yeah, so I'll answer this in two buckets. So the first is that I think we should just think much longer and harder about whether we have the responsibility and time and energy and patience and money to give a dog or a cat a really good life. You know, it is a 10, 15, 20 year plus commitment. And it takes up a lot of time every day. And it costs a lot of money. And I know that in the case of my dog, who's a three year old, uh, who has a lot of energy, it requires a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. And so I think first, we should just really think long and hard before we adopt a dog or cat. So that's number one. The second is if we decide, okay, we can do this. We have flexible schedules. We, we have everything we need to, to give a dog or a cat a better life. It doesn't stop there. That's really just the beginning. And so there's a lot that we can do practically to improve their lives. In the case of cats, if you're going to keep them indoors, you can start by giving them walks. You know, this sounds kind of silly, but why not? You know, we give dogs walks. Cats love being outdoors. A lot of cat experts think that cats are not even fully domesticated. They're semi-domesticated. And so they want to be outdoors. They want to be in nature. Mm -hmm. And so seeing if your cat wants to take a walk, not all will, but seeing if your cat wants to take a walk, easing them into it is a good start. I'd recommend listeners check out this guy named Jackson Galaxy. He's a, a cat expert, behaviorist, a YouTuber. He has a lot of great videos. And another part is also just what I call catifying one's home. And so that looks like installing, you know, scratch boxes and perches and high walkways. Hmm. Because this is what cats really like. They like having different vantage points and they like to be active and have these structures and toys that they can interact with. And there's also a, a, a number of what are called enrichment games that can be played with cats and dogs that go beyond just, you know, throwing a toy and asking them to play fetch. Another thing to consider is giving our dogs and cats more diverse diets. Again, this may seem like a kind of silly concern, but I know that I would absolutely go crazy if I had to eat the same thing every single day. And animals in the wild do have somewhat diverse diets. And so that's one really simple, practical thing, you know, we can all do. When it comes to dogs, uh, I think one thing to consider is positive reinforcement training. I think it's really surprising that the most popular dog trainer in the United States and, and perhaps the world is Caesar Milan, who has really relied on dominance theory training, which right. has been debunked by scientists for a number of years and mm -hmm. is condemned by animal veterinary behavior associations. And ultimately, you know, dogs come into this world, you know, having no understanding of our human norms and rules. And so we have to be really patient and try to see the world from their point of view and not just viewing any of the behavior that they express that we don't like as misbehavior. It's not misbehavior, it's them trying to get a need met. And so we need to better understand them and you know work on them on training in a positive way. And so I'd recommend people look up concepts like positive reinforcement training and cooperative care. And one other point I'll make on this is that I also think we really should entertain abolishing the ownership of small animals like birds, reptiles, rodents, fish, and amphibians. Because these are naturally wild, undomesticated animals who, you know, in nature will fly and swim and move great distances in a single day. But in modern day pet keeping, they're confined to small cages and tanks and enclosures for years on end. And I think it's really hard to make the argument that these animals have good lives. 
Kenny, thank you so much for this. Uh, it's fascinating to think about and um, I hope people don't feel too guilty, but I hope they can take something away from it. Thanks so much for having me, Jordan. Really appreciate it. Kenny Torella, writing for Vox. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. And here is where I give the contact information and the pet owners hopefully don't come after me en masse. Guys, if you want to talk about this, you really can. Uh, and I would love to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. You can email us with your thoughts at hello at the Big Story Podcast.ca. And you can call and leave a voicemail 416 935 5935 bonus points if you get your dog or cat to leave us a message. You can find The Big Story absolutely everywhere. If you listen to podcasts somewhere and you can't find this program, let us know. We'll get it there. And as always, if you like it, tell a friend. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Have a great weekend. We'll talk Monday.